Yes. Um, I love that Ghost Town Poetry Open Mic is now in an art gallery, and so this month there is a themed show um, on mythology and mythological creatures. Please uh, check that stuff out. There happens to be um, a painting by my wife and co-host, Tony. Where? Tony. The furthest back from me right now. Yeah, that's Tony's work. And plenty of other folks from the community that you know as well, some people that are here for the very first time. But one of the things that's great, other than just opening the space to us every month, is that um, Leah has done a little happy hour every time we do this. So she's going to show you now what some of the deals are that you could get next door. And uh, just a reminder, we go pretty long. So we're hoping at some time between when the break happens and when we're, we come to the bitter end <laughs> that you will uh, settle up your check. Don't wait until the very end of the evening to do that if possible, just that they don't have, you know, leave any of those hanging. Do you have anything that you want to say to the people? I just want to let you all know that next month is also a group show. My favorite one, the celebration of the male form. So if any of you are interested in creating a piece for that, I think, I think it's the Monday after Christmas. So you can always ask Greg for more information or find it on our Facebook page. Or here's your name. Are you looking for balls? Um, I am not actually creating any of the art this time. I will just be observing. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, thank you for reminding and me. Thank you, Leah. And when she gets back there, she's going to shut off that music, too. So we thank you for being here. We are very happy to host um, two authors from Airly Press tonight, Karen McPherson and Tim Shaner, who are right here in front of me. Let's give them a hand. If you don't know about Early Press, it's a very interesting model where each author um, agrees to spend a certain amount of time on the sort of production end of things at the press, and then at the at the end of that, they have a book of their own that, that comes out. So it is a way of doing this, and I think it's an interesting way, so you might ask them about it or look into it. And there is some information back by uh, their books about the press. So um, we're excited to um, have them, and it's not the first time that we have um, supported early press authors and we will continue to support them as often as we can fit them into our busy schedule here. Um, so we uh, lost a great uh, poet and songwriter, um, the uh, American Indian um, spokesperson uh, John Trudell, lost him a couple of days ago. He's somebody that mattered a lot to me and to Tony and I was fortunate enough to um, Go. I, I almost said open for, it, that makes it sound heavier than it is. I went on just before him at Hempstock uh, here in Portland a few years ago when they were still doing it underneath the bridge over by <laughs> OMSI and it was great to meet him and also interviewed him for Rain Taxi which is a Midwest publication that I've been writing for since about 1999. And you know, he was one of those people who's multi-talented, not afraid to um, say those things that make people uncomfortable or the things that they just need to hear about, um, you know, what's uh, sort of gone wrong here in America. So, you know, Tony and I both wanted to do something for him and I'm going to just read one of, his, uh, one of his pieces to you. This is called Grandmother Moon. <clears throat> you are more than light in the night. You are more than the moon. You are spirit connection. Your energy is our life. You are memories to generations past. You are the creator of sensations that will always last. You are the knowledge, the teacher, the influence to keep the people sane. You are a healer for spirit pain. Grandmother Moon, we love you and we are angry at the invaders who trash you and violate our universe with their mechanical uncleanliness. We pray for you for us and for the invader who just can't comprehend respect, love, or the balance of life. We do not join the invading madness. From the way they act, it speaks of spirit sadness. Machine, money, progress is the cause of our common abuse. We see you, grandmother. We feel you. We love you. We know through your reality we will endure. We are one. We pray for you. We pray for you. That's John Trudell. And you know, something that we poets don't talk about a whole lot, and artists, I think, maybe are shy to talk about it too, is that one of the things that 
could be a part of your process is some kind of a stab at immortality because often enough the work is here after we're physically gone. And I certainly think that John Trudell is one of those people whose um, poems and songs and ideas will continue even though he's no longer physically with us. So um, as I said, he was also really important to Tony and so um, Tony is going to come up and uh, read a little something for John too. to me for a lot of reasons, and those of you in the room who are old enough to remember Wounded Knee and, and sort of this um, attempt to, to m make the things that were really felt deeply at that point in time known out beyond that community. Um, he was a leader. Um, he was a leader with the protests against the BIA, um, Alcatraz, Vietnam, Wounded Knee, and a number of things. One of the um, times uh, w when I first heard of him had to do with his, him protesting, and one of the things that he did by protesting was to burn the U.S. flag um, in an attempt to say, wait a minute, whose country might this be, um, making a stand about what had happened quite some time ago regarding the, um, the Native American people. Um, at the day after he burned the U.S. flag, his pregnant wife, his children, and his mother-in-law um, died in a very suspicious house fire. He lost his entire family like that. And so what that did for me was just to think, wow, you know, how, who knows what was at the root of the fire, but I think that John thought it was suspicious enough that if he was making waves and being loud enough, that something would happen to the people that he cared about. He had feared that, and indeed it did happen. So um, that just really made, made a, um, an impression on me. And as a result, I wrote this poem. It's called A Reason for Corn. John Trudell is following the lines, a mandate for life since the day of the fire. Before following the lines, there was Vietnam and Alcatraz, Wounded Knee, and the BIA. A warning the day he burned the U.S. flag. Twelve hours later, smoke and flames claimed all he loved. For now, his loves are embedded in the land. He knows that five bodies in boxes below dirt will surely grow corn. John Trudell will follow the lines as any poet must until the day the land swallows him whole and corn grows in lines where he once stood. Thank you. So one, one of the things that I talk about when I'm fortunate enough to be um, in the classroom with writers too, is that this is a really great time to learn about uh, poetry if you're starting from the very beginning, and one of the reasons is YouTube, and I would say that you can find a ton of uh, John Trudell's songs and footage of John on YouTube, so if you're curious, that would be a quick way to uh, educate yourself. And uh, as we always do, our first open mic reader is also going to be our videographer, so she can continue to do what she does so well, uh, immortalizing these readings um, on YouTube, and I'm someone where all my family is on the East Coast, so if they want to see what I'm doing, they can't physically be here, but they can check it out. So um, let's uh, give a warm welcome to Tiffany Schramm. Thank you. Um, this first one, I had, um, I went to New York in October to celebrate my birthday, and I posted some pictures, and so Bruce Hall responded to my pictures with this poem and then there's a response to him. So this is from Bruce Hall. How dark and ugly would a city be without electricity? Solar won't help, it's dark outside. The river is calm, wind won't work. The rats in the city can see, provided by coal and nuke. Oh, it's far away so the city rat doesn't worry about the bad. Just the nice lights so the city rat can eat whatever city rats eat. Oh, but the rats eat well here, Bruce. 
They dine on ambitions, feast on failures. They only starve when the city streets are quiet. The rats walk around plump and out of shape while the people are trimmed from walking miles of city blocks. The city nourishes me without lifting a fork to my mouth. It provides, it provides the drunk without drinking the Jameson. Even in the crowded streets, people shoulder to shoulder, I can find my peace. I can even rest in a city that never sleeps. <laughs> So this next poem, um, actually somebody told me about it, it's by Sarah Kay, it's called The Type, um, and I really like the poem. So I'm going to read it. If you grow up the type of woman, a woman men want to look at, you can let them look, but do not mistake eyes for hands, or windows, or mirrors. Let them see what a woman looks like. They may have never seen a woman before. If you grow up the type of woman men want to touch, you can let them touch you. Sometimes it's not you they are reaching for. Sometimes it's a bottle, a door, a sandwich, a Pulitzer, or another woman. But their hands found you first. Do not mistake yourself for a guardian, or a muse, or a promise, or a victim, or a snack. You are a woman, skin and bones, veins and nerves, hair and sweat. You are not made of metaphors, not apologies, not excuses. If you grow up the type of woman men want to hold, you can let them hold you. All day they practice keeping their bodies upright. Even after all this evolving, it still feels unnatural, still strains the muscles, holds firm the arms and the spine. Only some men will want to learn what it feels like to curl themselves around you into a question mark. It meant they do not have the answers they thought they would have by now. Some men will want to hold you like the answer. You are not the answer. You are not the problem, you are not the poem, or the punchline, or the riddle, or the joke. Woman, if you grow up the type men want to love, you can let them love you. Being loved is not the same thing as loving. When you fall in love, it's discovering the ocean. After years of puddle jumping, it is realizing you have hands, it is reaching for the tightrope when the crowds have all gone home. Do not spend time wondering if you're the type of woman men will hurt. If he leaves you with a car alarm heart, you can learn to sing. It is hard to stop loving the ocean, even after it has left you gasping, salty. Forgive yourself for the decisions you have made, the ones you still call mistakes when you tuck them in at night. And know this, know you are the type of woman who is searching for a place to call yours. Let the statues crumble. You have always been the place. You are a woman who can build it yourself. You are born to build. And this next one um, is called, When the Moon Falls from the Sky, Let It Gently Fall Gently in My Hands. The rain just doesn't want to seem to stop. Just inch after inch, puddle after puddle. I watch drip after drop fall from the man sitting beside me on the bus. His shoes seem to hold more water than mine. My jacket is damp as a cold chill runs up my neck. This is winter in the Northwest, a damp, cold grayness that settles so deep in your bones it will take till July to finally dry out. The moon is doing six shows a week. Each night it varies ever so slightly. Sometimes he's full, half, or just a sliver. He seems to continue to watch over me, direct me into the arms of selfish lovers, keeps my heart as his own. He gives me a few earthly men that provide warmth, even though they at times feel as far away as the moon. When I do find my love and the moon's heart finally breaks, let him fall gently from the sky into the palm of my hands. I will place his remaining fragments of brokenness right next to the jar of tears I keep beside my bed. <laughs> It's called Coming Home, and I wrote this when I was coming home from New York. It rained the morning I left. Even this tough place sheds tears when I leave. I did all my crying the two previous days. I knew it was coming. I could feel the sadness as leaving is always the hardest part. I grow quiet in the days after my birthday. So many visions, so many thoughts that rest on surfaces of empty whiskey glasses. Sisters are hard as their love and protection leave thorns around my tongue make it hard for me to speak. 
Brothers are kind and support the openness of a life lived without regrets. Friends love and enjoy, embrace and cheer. They remind me I'm rare and worthy of love. My hometown welcomes me home with tears too. The rain washes away city grime, damaged hearts, and fulfilled fantasies. The Northwest knows it's losing the battle, so it flashes sunlight through gray clouds. This is to remind me I belong here too. Thank you. So, um, CTRAN and Arts of Clark County sponsored a uh, poetry contest. Tony and I were the judges of the contest. And this was a contest to find uh, poems by Clark County poets that would appear on the buses here. And there are 166 buses. Uh, so there are um, 10 um, different poems, including one from each of us. Um, so eight winners plus the two of us. And there will be a celebration of this program, which is called Poetry Moves, at the Westfield Shopping Center uh, in the food court at one o'clock on Sunday. Uh, we, all, we wanted to, you know, we're excited about this. We also wanted to, some of you to come and join us and help us celebrate. And we happen to have a couple of the people um, who are, whose poems are gonna be on the bus here with us. So if you're gonna be on the bus, would you please just stand? There's a couple of you here. And we just, because we're so excited, we wanted to show you an example of what the uh, channel cards are going to look like. So, Tony has the channel card for Tim Pine. And this is called Counterpart by Tim Klein. It's a poem called Bandit Bus. And this is called Counterpart by Tim Klein. He's a uh, Vancouver, Washington. The poem is, at this very moment, someone, somewhere, is doing the very same thing you are doing for the very same reason. And that's Tim's poem. Yeah, and this, this reading, Ghost Town Poetry Open Mic is All Ages and Uncensored, that's the only way that I would do it. As we were looking at the different poems, we wanted to think about what's the experience of riding the bus and how do we want people to feel if they were to unexpectedly encounter a poem on the bus. So there are thought-provoking poems or poems about serious subject matter, but overall we steered away from poems that might bring somebody down, you know, so you're thinking someone's on their way to work or maybe to court or something, you know. We want it to be something that would lift them up a little bit as they're taking this ride on the bus. And so um, I hope that you can join us on Sunday afternoon to celebrate them. And um, they have also, Arts of Clark County um, has Poetry Moves balloons that they are going to dispense. So there'll be uh, Poetry Moves balloons all over the place and it should be fun. So I hope you can join us for that and congratulations to uh, those of you that, are, that will be on the bus. It's going to be fun. Okay, and so now I believe we have someone who's reading for, with us for the first time. Isn't that true? Yes, first time. So let's give her a warm welcome. Please say hello to Carol Hayes. grow by the dunes with rasping, quaking fronds that ebb and flow on their secret tides of wind. Wave patterns form in the cool shadowed sand at their feet. I sit rock-like among those sandy hillocks to gaze at the sea through the eyes of a stone and watch myself becoming sand. This one's called Benediction. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Glowing sunset, blessing sand, blood of sun's decline, smoothly slipping, touching water, silken sheen of tide, amber into burnished dark with purple hues of night, gently blending wave by wave till sound replaces sight. So some people say that poets are in love with the sound of their own voice, which happens to be true most of the time. But 
closer that you get to the microphone, the more like the voice of God you will sound. So do not be afraid of the microphone. And also, it comes off. So if the thing is the stand is freaking you out a little bit, just unclip it and you can hold it right under your mouth if that's what you prefer. Uh, next we are going to hear from April Bullard. Come on down, April. Shameless plug. Just illustrated a new book, Doodle Duck. It's a color your own storybook. Nice. Had a lot of fun. It was written by a nine-year-old girl and just had so much fun and trouble trying to illustrate it all. But it's out now and it's available. You can check my website, Paper Tiger Coffee Roasters, and other places coming. Congrats. Thank you. Winter can be a stressful season. And one thing I do to relieve the stress is kind of look through mail order catalogs and <laughs> daydream a little. But I found a solution in one of my mail order catalogs to stress. Hmm. Whenever things don't go so well and you want to hit the wall and yell, here's a little damn it doll that you can <laughs> do without. <laughs> Just grasp it firmly by the legs and find a place to slam it. And as you whack the stuffing out, yell, damn it, damn it. <laughs> and being a little twisted and dark as I am, I found a winter poem by William Wordsworth. It's titled Lucy Gray. Oft I had heard of Lucy Gray, and when I crossed the wild, I chanced to see at break of day of the solitary child. No mate, no comrade Lucy knew. She dwelt on a wide moor, the sweetest thing that ever grew beside a human door. You yet may spy the fawn at play, the hare upon the green, but the sweet vase of Lucy Gray will never more be seen. Tonight will be a stormy night. You to the town must go and take a lantern, child, to light your mother through the snow. That father I will gladly do, Tis scarcely afternoon. The minster clock has just struck two, and yonder is the moon. At this, the father raised his hook and snapped a faggot band. He plied his work, and Lucy took the lantern in her hand. Not blither is the mountain row. With many a wanton stroke, her feet disperse the powdery snow that rises up like smoke. The storm came on before its time. She wandered up and down. And many a hill did Lucy climb, but never reached the town. The wretched parents all that night went shouting far and wide, but there was neither sound nor sight to serve them for a guide. At daybreak on a lonely hill they stood that overlooked the moor, and thence they saw the bridge of wood, a furlong from their door. They wept, and turning homeward cried, In heaven we all shall meet when in the snow the mother spied the print of Lucy's feet. Then downward from the steep hill's edge they tracked the footmark small, and through the broken hawthorn hedge and by the long stone wall, and then an open field they crossed. The marks were still the same. They tracked them on, nor never lost, and to the bridge they came. They followed from the snowy bank those footmarks one by one into the middle of the plank, and further, there were none. Yet some maintain that to this day she is a living child, that you may see sweet Lucy Gray upon the lonesome wild. Or rough and smooth she trips along and never looks behind, and sings a solitary song that whistles in the wind. <laughs> Thank you, April. We're going to hear uh, next from Rainy. Come on up, Rainy. Wow. Oh. <laughs> I want to sound like God. <laughs> Honorary nuptial poem. Two old poets.
poets met at Barnes and Noble determined to brainstorm and co-write a poem to honor their poet friends who are getting married. They sipped libations and wrote descriptive words about the betrothed couple. Laughter was mostly at themselves for embarking on a fool's journey. Greeting cards were mentioned. Herb thought they could lift a few lines. Rainey was convinced of their joint creativity. However, their wells, by all testing, were dry. They wandered about until they found wedding cards. Nothing seemed right. So they decided to try the blank cards. The two poets perused the blank cards with zeal. Each chose two to take home and sleep on. Herb warned Rainey not to really sleep on her cards because he thought it would be rude to give used cards. So Christopher and Tony, this is your honorary poem to celebrate your nuptials. Herb thinks you won't like it. I said, it's the thought that counts. <laughs> Have a joyous merging and here's to a long inspired life together from Anonymous. <laughs> because, um, of course, they got married earlier this year. And you know how hard it is to shop for people that have been on the planet as long as they have. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> OK, and I have a little short one. Soul desire. When I get to heaven, I hope I can say, it was a great run. I loved and was loved and played and worked each day. I had lots of good friends and a faithful mate, and every second with him was like the best ever date. My career was fulfilling, and his was too. We made a life of adventure, service, and being true blue. And in my last moments, the goodbyes were sweet. We kissed and said fare thee well, until next we meet. Hello, stranger, do tell, is it you? <laughs> trailing across my skin till I am dampened from head to toe. Deliberately, the rain increases, pouring out from the sky, washing away cares, soothing the stress from my brow. My skin tingles with his touch. Droplets trickle down, exciting every nerve, bringing a rosy flush to my pale skin. With a lover's touch, the rain caresses my body, embracing me with his love. Parting my lips, I taste the sweetness of our first kiss. My soul is refreshed. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Darcy Schultz. poet. Nest clutter. Raven eye sees past horizon finding shiny words. Raven claw plays with years of shredded bits of ink and paper, hoping for the right bit, but can only find old words. So she looks at sky, remembering the future. Beak opens. Wing wind blows stanks your way, breeze before sound. <laughs> Shapeshifter, flying from the mountain of sun, raven hid. Nobody noticed. Far away, 
A girl thinks, what a strange vacation this is turning out to be. But she does not remember what she is vacationing from. She keeps dreaming about the mountain road. And she likes shiny, sharp metal and strands of men's hair. Thinks about nests and flying off cliffs. And she watches and watches, sees through the clear water of thought and desire, ripping herself with vision. A silver leaf dangles holding a claw. Wheat-colored hair blows on the plain, revealing nothing. She could dance with a man. She could tear him apart. When she goes home, she will meet it again, her black feathery soul. Here's my water poem. <laughs> If the pre pre previous reader also was talking about rain. In the hour of flood. In the hour of flood, I lifted dark wings and sang a call to blue wildness over red rock and unwood pine. I tangoed from wet branch to wet branch, seeking sun through storm, calling over the rush of water channeled by ancient wizard rock and dammed by drifting, dismembered tree. Desert stream is roaring to life below, crying out, you cannot hold me. Now spent at peace, clamor and tears falling like sap echoing into wet earth. I see the sun tear off her veils in silent weeping, heralding miracles of death and sand and windswept branch fallen into mold of mud. All is not lost. I will fly on, pressing west to find home again. Airborne, I call to the old ones. Their silence tells me who I am. I will fly on. Reincarnation. Born into the body of a girl erupting into earth. On Thursday, the faraway face of the woman in the photograph on the back of the poetry book fills with your new flesh. Is this a dream or what death foretold to me? But in the dream, if I approach, you'll disappear. I rip white sticky brambles off my arms and hands, shake free, and back again in green mirage your face. I fly to forest wide-eyed, hack and tear at thorns in the wood. My arms bleed in the face of a bear with your eyes stares from her cave. I chase the moon across the sky, and as we fall, bare breath pierces my skull. We are born into the body of a girl erupting into earth. Poets, I guess I should stand by the microphone, um, before we bring on our featured poets tonight. And um, for most of you know that when uh, Chris and I um, created uh, Printed Matter Vancouver, our small press, with the intent of putting together anthologies of our local writers, and um, our hope was that at some point after we launched the press and we put out our uh, anthologies that we could um, publish this next reader whose work is brilliant and uh, and we did and I am so proud of her um, her book is fabulous and she might still have some around somewhere so um, I want to introduce her to you tonight uh, Jenny Power come up and let this group hear what you have to say called Serenity in Brutal Garden. So, uh, I don't even know if you have any left. Do you I have, have so any? many. <laughs> okay. I'm on so many left. It makes um, a great Christmas gift. Yes, it does. <laughs> um, so, oh gosh. Uh, I, um, tr like, I, I, I was trying to get to a printer and don't have one at home. So, I have to uh, use my school 
uh, computer. And I hope you can bear with me as I uh, find things. I, I have two poems. Um, one of them I think is still a work in progress, but I want to share it anyway. Um, uh, last year, um, uh, I keep talking about it. I almost feel like I'm complaining, and I am. Um, I had a really difficult year last year, as I shared with you last time. And I wanted to thank you guys always, and you guys uh, who were here last week, because I really needed a safe place to be. Um, and uh, so I really appreciated that um, I could come here. Um, one of the things that happened, and I hope this is perfect. <laughs> you got to get on the cloud. I am on the cloud. <laughs> um, something is wrong. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. I know. You know what? I think this is a sign from the universe. I can only remember. I'll get there. Okay. So what happened last year was um, my mother died, uh, as I shared with you last um, last time, and um, uh, we're all guilty. Like. My sisters and I were having a hard time dealing with it because my mother, um, she was a little, um, I think she had uh, mental illness, like Tony and I have talked about this a lot, and um, so it was difficult to help her because she would never cooperate and um, the way that we needed her to. And um, so uh, I, I do have poems. Um, so I'm going to read this one first. I, I think I have both of them. So. I'll I'm going to read this, the next one. I'll move this up for you. Um, so, uh, she... Thanks for the note. my So, she, um, she had mental illness, I think. Now now I'm facing it. As a, uh, as a child and as a young adult, I didn't want to um, face it. Um, and now I understand that that's what she had. And it made it difficult for us to help her because she was very uncooperative. Um, and, uh, and it just was difficult. So what we did um, is we kind of detached from her, uh, we, and it was, when she died, there was a lot of grief, there was a lot of guilt. And so um, this is kind of addressing my sister too. Um, she is my half-sister, and actually she was abandoned by her father in Korea, um, and this is the poem that kind of addresses that. My oldest sister called me to tell me she had gone to a psychic who would help her talk to the dead particularly our mother, who we had not treated well. Instead of our mother, it was Kathy's biological father who finally showed up, the irony. In family mythology, he has always been Bluebeard, the big bad wolf, the archetypal seducer, the wartime American GI cliche. He had taken the virginity of my mother in Korea and made her happy for a few years and then abandoned her. It was then, I think, a piece of my mother started to unravel, and my sister's incarnation as the ache of a vengeful Kali began. His failure of character is a standard, if depressing, tale. But now, in the dull gray buzz of the afterworld, he wants to rewrite himself out of purgatory. According to the psychic, he even showed up in his formal military uniform. He says he tried to find me, Kathy says. I'm sorry. He says he tried to find me, Kathy says, and I want to scream, don't believe him, because I no longer believe in words. Actions are the only currency I'll accept, even from a ghost. You can't be stingy with redemption, a good, a good friend of mine tells me. You see things only in black and white. It's the perils of being an idealist. It's the idealists who suffer. The frauds are as happy as clams. <laughs> Fuck off, I tell him, <laughs> although his honesty is beautiful. Forgiveness is beautiful, too. I have never seen it in practice, but I've watched movies at least and seen it secondhand. Sometimes I feel I have forgiven, but I am never really certain. The old wounds open up too often, and the old poison seeps, setting on the blood on fire, and then it burns for days. My mother never knew forgiveness. She never knew peace. She struggled in the foul muck of her past like a doomed horse dying in quicksand, and we never knew how to save her. Did he love her? I asked Kathy, thinking of the one question my mother must have wanted to know. I'm sure he must have, she said, but it's not the question I needed to ask. Um, so I'm going to try one more, if that's 
okay. Um, this one is like, okay, last year my mother died and that was pretty awful. What was also awful is I got attacked by a dog. And um, I was walking my dog and uh, my neighbor um, had a dog that they kept chained in a fence. And if you own a dog, you know that is the worst thing that you can do. It makes the dogs crazy. So this dog had come loose from its um, fence before. And um, what happened is that uh, as I was, um, the last time it went straight for my dog and just attacked him. And so I managed to like scare the dog off by going, ah, and it stopped. And I thought, great, right? So the dog got loose again and I was walking my dog and I tried that same thing, ah, and it didn't work this time. Uh, instead he grabbed my thumb and he started like uh, worrying it in his mouth and he bit, uh, dislocated the thumb and I um, was, hitting him with this arm, he took a chunk out of that arm, and just by a miracle, he took off. Um, so that was traumatic, but what happened was that afterwards, um, I had to go to the occupational therapy, and I was feeling very vulnerable. It was a very vulnerable year for me. Um, and I had to go to occupational therapy, and my occupational therapist was awesome. And I developed a crush on him. <laughs> and it was bound to happen. <laughs> it's bound to happen. Um, it was never going to go anywhere because he's very totally in love with his wife. But um, I, and then I, I was like, this is nuts. So I stopped going to occupational therapy. Uh, so this poem <laughs> is for him. Uh, thankfully, he will never see this. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, What's his name? No. <laughs> the strangest apex on the geometrical marvel that is the world, turning on its axis, circling the puffing monstrosity that is our current sun. I stand at this apex alone, almost as if I am queen of the mountain, pretending to be satisfied with my locked away treasures and some tokens of attention thrown to me like penny wishes. I am the well. I am adept at counterfeiting regal airs, and people can't decide whether to love me or to hate me, but I keep the expression on my face inscrutable, knowing that enigmas are safe, and that regard is an arbitrary animal anyway, too often invited indoors and then spontaneously killed. Sometimes a smiling usurper will reveal the knife hidden in their coat sleeve and manage a cut or two. Usually I will bleed a little and smile back. That is usually enough to make them run. Last year, though, was the year the dynasty nearly fell. A year of court intrigues, heartbreaking loss, vicious betrayal, surprise attacks. I was lucky. The only thing permanently broken was my thumb. I went to a magician. He was a gentle healer who wanted to travel back in time, collect relics of history. After every meeting, he would walk me to the door, and I began to listen for the old world coastal lilt in his voice. He broke down my resistance enough that I let him hold my hand. After our first meeting, he never again had to ask for permission. I would lay my hand on the table before him, trust that his only intention was to help me. I believed him to be kind, so I kept my weapons on the ground. At the time, I felt as if I was living through a siege. My heart was winter. My soul was the black snap of a branch from a dying tree. He became a door, a pocket in the garment of a different universe. For an hour at a time, I would hide, grateful for these brief moments of rest. But there is no Eden without sin, and my sin was the sin of imagination and also of greed. I had slipped into a dream of wanting him, and I became restless, embarrassed by the predictability of my vulnerability and by the primitive wiring of my human needs. Detachment is a game that all must master, and I have come to realize the awesome stubbornness of my will. Once I became aware of the gravity of my feelings, I did not hesitate. I took action and withdrew. I have returned to being queen of the mountain, and I have learned to balance on the awkward angles of our shifting and precarious world. It is enough for me to know that the magician is safe in his castle, that he is happy and well. 
Throughout my story that I have learned that it is better to embrace aloneness, to live blinking in reality's harsh sun than to live like an addict in a dream. I have awakened to the beauty of my isolation and to the gift of freedom that it affords, the promise of new beginnings. For now, I will bless the memory of the magician, throw him unsolicited prayers of thanks like a bottle tossed into the ocean, carrying catharsis. As for myself, there is still the hope that perhaps one day I too will become a magician, a beacon for other wounded travelers in search of solace. I too will become a catalyst for healing, a quiet pathway to the redeeming power of love.